we'd like to thank you for being here today to worship the Lord. And also, as we start our new series, Pray and Then Vote. And as we were thinking about what God would want us to do here at the church, when we're evaluating and looking about what our candidates will be and who our politicians will be for the upcoming few years, when we had the opportunity to meet Mike Pompeo a few years ago in this exact same setting, we had the privilege of asking him some questions and and getting to know him goes back with me to be a part of a Bible study. Uh, so it's an enormous blessing. We should never take that for granted here in America that we all have that opportunity to live out our, our Christian faith uh, in the political space as well. Good. Amen. When you are back here in Wichita, what, tell me about your church. What do you do? Do you go to church or uh, do you have a local church? I do. So Susan and I are members at Eastminster Presbyterian Church. Uh, have been for uh, a long time now. I think uh, 15 years or 16 years now. We taught uh, fifth grade Sunday school there. Uh, for quite a while. Uh, that that skill set of managing fifth graders has come in really handy back in Washington. Uh, uh, and so, so we do. And we go to church there often, although what's, what's been great, uh, one of the true blessings of uh, being the congressman is I've had the chance to go to churches all across the 4th District. Folks invite us to come out and sit and worship with them, and that has been a joy too. So we spend uh, fewer Sundays at our home church than we did, sure. uh, and, and more time in other places. And we've had great faith experiences everywhere we've gone. Amen. Well, over the last few weeks, watching the news. It has been very disturbing uh, nationally and locally. But one of the major issues nationally would be, of course, our borders. And how, what do you think is the process that we need to do as a, as a country to protect our borders and also to take care of all of the issues that that border crossing allows? That's a great question. It may be the most immediate pressing question. There was this tragedy in Ukraine this week, but this pressing issue for America, uh, I'll start here. So I I think about this in my role as a member of Congress a little bit differently do in my my role as an evangelical Christian. Uh, The churches face an enormous uh, humanitarian crisis. Uh, They are are, are rallying to try and address these needs, these terrible crises that's taking place, uh, mostly in Texas, but now in Oklahoma. Uh, Won't surprise me if it reaches Kansas before we move through that. Uh, And so I've had pastors come to me and talk about how they're going to try and make sure that the basic needs of these young people are met, and I I, I appreciate that completely. But I have to share with you, it it is not compassionate uh, for a country to allow uh, mothers to believe that if they have their children travel this uh, trek across uh, a thousand miles plus and come to America, that they'll they'll find a place here. Um, We we have got to enforce our our borders. Uh, I could go on for a long time about how we've not done that for an awfully long time, before this president's time even, um, we weren't serious about enforcing the rule of law and making sure that we flipped it. Today, if you want to come here illegally, um, you you can get here. If you want to come here lawfully, it is very, very difficult. We're a compassionate nation. We're the 
we, we remain a Christian beacon to the world. We should never forget that. Um, but at the same time, we, we have an obligation to maintain our sovereignty as a country uh, to ensure that we don't have the risk that is now not only humanitarian and an Im immigration crisis, but now we have a national security crisis too. I spend a lot of time uh, worrying about radical Islamic terrorism, and we have a porous border, and they know that too. That's true. That's true. Uh, another question that's on the national news, as well as Israel and uh, Gaza. Uh, what is all that about? And how in the world, as a Christian, when we're saying that, that God is going to bless those that bless Israel and protect those that bless Israel, what are we as a country doing? And what is your position on the protection of Israel and the right for Israel to be a state? So this, this is an ongoing challenge for, for Israel and for America. Uh, I, we have, uh, we have a, a fundamental, both Christian and American obligation to do everything we can to help the Israelis defend themselves. We have been incredibly generous to Israel. We've provided a lot of resources so they could build what's called Iron Dome. It stopped a lot of death, a lot of missiles from landing from Hamas uh, terrorists in, in the southern part of the Gaza Strip. What, what, what I think um, has been most disappointing is our president has created this moral equivalency uh, between the terrorists in Gaza and in Palestine, uh, Palestinian territory in the West Bank, and between the Israelis. We, we all know this. If, if the, the terrorists put down their weapons tomorrow, there would be peace between Hamas and Israel. If the Israelis put down their weapons tomorrow, the chance of there being in Israel would be very low. Th those are not morally, morally equivalent positions, and America should never treat them as such, and we should continue to provide all the resources that our great nation can uh, to help the Israelis uh, protect themselves and all the Christian biblical sites and everything that comes with that amazing place. Okay. Watching the local news over the last uh, month or so, uh, there's been some accusations about you uh, about uh, the Affordable Care Act and some of the votes that maybe you have made on the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare. Um, what have you done positionally in, in the United States Congress to overturn or to vote for or against the Obamacare in, um, in, the, in the state of election? So, I, it's, uh, so I, I think the Affordable Care Act is an enormous disaster <laughs> for our health care system, for Americans, uh, more broadly for our economics, for jobs, if folks are working in their first job, they were working 40 hours, they're now working 29. This is, is it needs to be repealed in its entirety. Uh, it, has, it has been a little frustrating to watch what's gone on on TV and see, uh, see a different version of that. Um, but I, I have great confidence in you all. Um, I, you, you all won't be misled. You'll, 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 you'll figure it out. And I say that about me too. You should check out everything we say. You should pray and watch. Uh, and make sure that what we're telling you every day is uh, the truth as we then know it. Um, I continue to think uh, we need to get rid of the Affordable Care Act in its entirety. Uh, I'm hopeful that there will be an election in November and uh, the good Lord will see fit to elect leaders that will be prepared to do that from, from either party um, who will stand up and, and, and get rid of the Affordable Care Act. I don't, I don't dislike the Affordable Care Act because Barack Obama put it in place. I, I dislike it because it has done so much destruction to our economy here in South Central Kansas to our healthcare system, if you talk to your doctor or your nurse or your, your PA, I, I can assure you they, they think it has set them back. Uh, and then finally, it has also had an enormous impact on religious freedom as well. Uh, we had a, a good outcome in the Supreme Court a couple weeks back now with Hobby Lobby, uh, but uh, our government should never have had to turn to a court, a bunch of folks in black robes, to protect religious freedom as well. And so I hope we can get rid of it as quickly as we can, and then we can set about fixing what was an imperfect healthcare system even before that. I want to follow up on that question a little bit. One of the things that uh, your opponent has said is that uh, you have voted for Obamacare seven times. What in the world would he get that information? Is there a coattail election or, or, or vote? Yeah. How would he get that information and be able to communicate that to? So there are half a dozen votes. I think they've said six or seven. They were enormous pieces of legislation that contained, contained funding for an agency, Health and Human Services. Our former governor was running it at the time. Uh, uh, and it had funding for them, and so you can, you can make a plausible argument, you can stretch the reality and say, hey, that was a vote in support of the Affordable Care Act, but if, if, you're, going to, if you're going to say that, boy, there's lots of things. Uh, you, you, could, you could make arguments that he voted for lots of really bad things, too, in his time. Oftentimes you face a piece of legislation that reduced the size of government, that's what each of these had done, something that I think is an imperative for our country, 
and it contains a little bit of funding for one thing, uh, and you can go turn that on its head and, and make a claim that is just fundamentally not reflective of reality. I will never do that. I, we, I've had folks call us and say, hey, you should say your opponent voted for X because it, that money was in there for this little thing that's it's really cute, it's clever, it's, it's also not right. <laughs> and uh, it's inconsistent with my, my vision of how campaigns ought to be run. And so I, I'm not going to do that. I'm gonna to continue to convince folks that I think this is what the healthcare system ought to look like and it should be a healthcare system that doesn't have the Affordable Care Act. I'd, I'd never vote for anything that I thought furthered uh, what I think is a really, really dangerous piece of legislation. Okay. Uh, one more question. Um, you know, the local economy. Uh, Wichita, Kansas, uh, uh, the air capital of the world. Yes, sir. Okay. And uh, what have you done in Washington to help out the local economy and to stimulate the local economy when we feel like things are being very... Um, trodden on, going downgraded. What can we do to help booster the local economy in Wichita, and what have you done in order to make that happen? That's a great question. So, you know, I, I came out of that world. I, I worked in the aviation industry for a decade. I ran a small machine shop uh, for, for 10 years before I went to Congress three and a half years ago. Uh, I guess I'd say two things that I've, I've worked diligently on for uh, three and a half years. The first was something called the Small Aircraft Revitalization Act. It, it shared my vision of getting government out of your way. It, it impacted the Federal Aviation Administration, the FAA. It pushed them back into a, an appropriate role for them where they had expanded their power to places it didn't need to be. And over time, it will let Beach and Cessna and all our small aircraft uh, suppliers uh, get their products from an idea to the uh, airplane much more quickly. So it is a limited government vision of how you help the South Central Kansas economy. Uh, I suppose I could have gone there and asked for a bunch more of your money for a bailout. I just never think that's the right answer. I always think if we can leave more money in your pockets, uh, you all will figure out how to do that. I guess the second thing uh, would be is that um, here in Kansas, we, we do have this vision of uh, our ability to take care of ourselves uh, without an enormous overweening federal government. And so have spent a lot of time trying to push back on the Environmental Protection Agency and on OSHA and all these folks who are who are, are entering our lives in ways that are inappropriate. I, I always think when, when there's a need, and, and we see need all throughout South Central Kansas, when there's a need, uh, the place that that can be most effectively addressed is places like we are this morning, Glenville Baptist Church. You all will join together to, to help folks. You'll know them. You'll know what it is they really need. It oftentimes isn't just a rainbow check. It's, uh, it's a prayer. It is uh, someone to put their arm around them. Uh, the federal government just is incapable of doing that. So I've worked hard to get government out of our way so that um, you all can go do the things you want to do and that people will invest in Kansas and we'll get the jobs back that we so desperately need here. Okay. Uh, one more question that I would like to ask you to have some closing remarks. I, we believe that uh, one of the biggest issues in Washington is uh, no term limits. We believe that uh, sometimes when a politician can stay in Washington for 40, 50, 60 years, um, it doesn't do the city, the state, or the country yes, good. Are your plans is to stay in Washington for the next 30 or 40 years to be a uh, uh, lifetime politician? You just gave my wife a heart attack. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I've been doing this three and a half years now. Uh, when, we, when my wife and I prayed with our son uh, about whether we should leave what was a, a, a wonderful opportunity that I had, a job I had here. We, we loved spending our time here in Kansas.
I'd go back when I was in Washington to go do that. And I'd get back here just about every time I could. We, we travel back to Kansas almost every week to listen, to understand, to make sure I was still headed in, down the right path. Uh, and then again, talk to you and, and vote that way. That's how you should evaluate everyone that you cast your ballot for. Uh, we're a Christian nation, and uh, that is important. And so I get asked all the time, like, how do you square your political role with your Christian faith? And for me, this is, this is not a, that's actually not, not a difficult one. Um, there's not a single thing that I do uh, as your representative that isn't impacted by my belief in Jesus Christ as my Savior. I think about it all the time. My wife, when she comes back and we do our Bible studies, it is what allows us to keep going when we get tired. Um, we think about you all. We think about our obligation uh, to our God and to our country. And so as you evaluate, folks, you should, you should measure us by our deeds. We'll all be imperfect. There's some vote I've taken that just drives you crazy, I'm sure. Uh, but uh, evaluate us as against what we promised uh, and what we said we would do. And when you do that, uh, you all will make good decisions when you go vote on August 5th. And I, uh, I really appreciate the opportunity of been able to be with you and, and worship with you this morning. Okay. At the end of our service, uh, we're going to have a little challenge here in a second. And then we're going to talk about praying before we vote. And if you and your wife would not mind, at the end of our service, I'm going to ask you to come down here to the front. And uh, our church family, whether they vote for you or not, is yes, we have a biblical mandate to pray for our leaders. And right now, you're one of our leaders. You're our representation into Washington. So we are going to have you guys come down here at the end of the service and lay, have, lay hands on you and pray over you uh, before we're dismissed today, if you don't we, mind doing we that. We would appreciate all that right. very God much. God bless you. Thank we you for letting me come. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Next week, we will have uh, his opponent, Todd Tehart, will be here uh, sharing, asking uh, some of those exact same questions so we could hear from both sides of, of, the, of the aisle, if you would say, uh, as far as what God would have us vote for in those honest questions. And some of the things that we have to look at, it is said that less than 50% of Christians will go to the, vo the voting place and vote. And how can we have a major impact in our society if those that are called Christians do not go and to look into the political system? I do not believe a church should be total political. But I do believe that we should be able to vote our conduct and vote our conscience and vote our character. And whether it's a Republican or whether it's a Democrat is not the issue. The issue, what does the Bible say and do we hold to those firm beliefs? Do we understand what we believe in, what we will hold on to? General Douglas MacArthur said this, History fails to record a single precedent in which nations subject to moral decay have not passed into political and economic decline. There has been either a spiritual awakening to overcome the moral lapse or a progressive deterioration leading to the ultimate national disaster. There has to be a wake-up. I know that in our church that we do not all believe the same thing politically. I know that there are people that believe a lot of different things than what I believe. And my job is not to communicate to you and say, this is what I believe or this is what you should believe. What I believe that we have one common denominator, and that common denominator is Jesus Christ and what he has given to us, which is eternal life and our future is in heaven with him. That is our common denominator. And we are aliens in this world. We are not going to live here forever. God has promised us 70 or 80 years, and we are passed off and we're going to heaven. But what do we leave behind? What is it that our, our life is all about? What are we going to leave? And I believe some of the things that we look at and some of the things that we vote for have to say that we have a firm foundation and a belief in this issue. In Psalms chapter 33, verse 12, it said, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people who choose his inheritance. Blessed is a nation that the Lord is their God, who is a follower of Christ. I want so much for our nation to be blessed by God. I want so much for our church 
to be blessed by God. I want so much for our politicians to be blessed by God. But more importantly than all of those things, I want God's hand above everything else to look out and say, how can we protect this country for our next generation? For the kids that are being born now. I would go to the hospitals on a monthly basis with little babies being born. And I hold those little babies and I wonder, 20 years from now, what are they going to inherit? What are we going to be? What are we going to look like? And it's our moral character today to say, I have an opportunity to form, to hold, to shape a little segment, a fourth district of the state of Kansas that represents you in Washington. What do we do with that vote? What do we do? Do we stay home and say it makes no difference? Or do we look at these candidates and say, which one of these candidates best signifies my vote? Maybe it's not even one of these candidates. Maybe you're a Democratic candidate. And in November, you're going to vote for somebody else. And you know what? That is your call. That's what you can do. I just ask you, take the Bible, take the Word of God, and look at what God has given to us as a mandate to do. In Psalm chapter 9, verse 17, it says, The wicked shall be turned into hell, and all the nations that forget God. We have to stand firm as a country. We have a great heritage. And remember our spiritual roots. Remember where we came from. This is not July 4th. This is not Labor Day. This is not Veterans Day. This is a day that we have set apart to look at what God has done for us. And when we look at our country, we look at our heritage, we look at the legacy that God has given to us, we have been a nation that we cannot deny have been blessed by God. Above measure, above anything else, our country has been blessed by God. But I believe that right now we are at a crucible. We are at a stage are we going to turn our hearts towards or are we going to turn our backs towards? What do we do? What do we do? We, it's important that we evaluate that I have something in store. George Washington said this, the first quote in your bulletin, did we bring the Bible to these shores or did not rather it bring us? The word of God was established and that is one of the purposes of this country being alive. So we cannot take the word of God and say, it makes no difference. It does make a difference. It makes a difference between our character, our constitution, who we truly are. John Quincy Adams said this, the highest glory of the American Revolution was this, it connected in one indissolvable bond the principle of civil government with the principles of Christianity. It is a bond, the principles of government and the principles of Christianity. They are together. And from the and to the fundamental orders of Connecticut. The state, the government, owes its origin to the wise disposition of the divine providence. The word of God requires an orderly and decent government established according to God to maintain and preserve the liberty and the pur purity of the gospel. They go hand in hand. Daniel Webster, more than all, our government and our country were founded from the very first fathers under the divine light of Christian religion. Anyone who would wish that this country exist had otherwise begun to, de to be deceived. Let us not forget the spiritual character and origin. We have to look at our roots. We have been founded by the Christian nation. We should allow we, the church, the Christian nation, to stand firm and say, I have a responsibility. I have a right. I can go with God on any topic, on any decision. We must look at our origin. And then, I believe this is to be true too, we need to repent of our national sins. We need to repent of our national sins. Second Chronicles chapter 7, and verse 14. One of my favorite scriptures. If my people, who are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will hear, heal their land. Um, you know, we could talk about the country's sins. We could talk about everything that everybody else has done. But you know, when we're talking to the church, I believe the church has done a bigger injustice than anything else. And that injustice was the injustice of just apathy. We have 
went on coast mode. We could talk about taking prayer out of schools. And we could point our fingers at the presidents, and we could point our fingers at the congressmen, and we could put our fingers at the Supreme Court. But do you know where it lies? Do you know the church is the mightiest force upon the planet? We have more volunteers in the Christian realm that if we, as, a, um, as the believers of this world, not just Wichita, of the world, if we would come together and say, we have a firm foundation that the word of God is our truth, and we are going to vote, and we're going to live out our faith, we, the church, should repent of our sin, of apathy. And if we would become engaged in what is truth, and what God would have been for us, not what's going to impact us economically, but what's going to impact us in our faith? But so often we'll look that if it's going to impact me and it's going to cost me another $10 or $20, I don't want to vote for that. I, I want this. We should not vote due to our economic status. We should vote due to our Christian character. What does the Word of God state? So we, we could point our fingers and we could say all kinds of downward trends of the government. We could look at all these negatives that have taken place. And there are a lot that we could look at. But I truly believe before I can take the splinter out of the government's eyes, I have to turn at the church and I have to take the plank out of my own eye. Because we, Glenville, the church, we have winked at our own apathy for so long. And what we have done, we have allowed a government, we have allowed a country, we have allowed a system to take off out of our control. If we, the church, would take the word of God, read it, and understand it, and apply it, do you know what, to be honest with you, Washington would look a whole lot different. Somebody give me an amen. It would look a lot different if we would understand Israel is God's hand. He is going to bless those, and he is going to bless those that honor him. We need to look at what God has in store for them. We need to look at what God wants for us. We have to repent and say, no longer will I just be a seat in a church. No longer will I just pray on Sunday. I'm going to activate. I'm going to get involved. I'm going to pray and I'm going to use what God has given to me, a voice that could change the world. Repent for our national sins. And then renew our commitment to God and country. Renew our commitment to God and country. I think this is so important. When we talk about renewing our commitment to God and country, when you look at the news, and we all have, over the last few weeks, just the last week alone, we look at the chaos. We look at the conflict. We look at the Middle East. And we say, man, I'm glad that's a long ways from here. But do you know what? It's not. We live in a very mobile, global society. And what they do over there very quickly impacts us here. That is so important. That's why we have men and women that are making decisions based on the protection of our country. We cannot allow us to wink at what has taken place over the seas, thousands of miles away. We watch on CNN instantaneously what has taken place, and we wipe our foreheads and say, wow, I'm glad it's over there, but it's impacting us. Could you imagine a land lead missile hitting a passenger aircraft over Kansas ah, it would never happen it could happen instantaneously it happened New York things like that could take place just like that what we must do is we make a commitment to God we have to have God to protect us and to guide us. We need to put people in place that will help us protect our country. We have to have a commitment to God and then to our country. When we look at that commitment, what does that commitment look like? What can we do? Abraham Lincoln, in a call for national humility and prayer, fasting and prayer, says this. We have been the recipients of the choicest bounties of heaven. 
We have grown in numbers, wealth, and power, and no other nation has gone before. But we have forgotten God. We have vainly imagined in the deceitfulness of our hearts that these things were provided by some superior wisdom and virtue of our own. Intoxicated with unbroken success, we have become so self-sufficient to feel the necessity of and say this is what I deserve because you know what we all deserve we all deserve hell but God loved us and he died on the cross for us and when we accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior we gained heaven we don't deserve God's blessing we get God's blessing because he loved us and he sent his son to die for us. And that's what Christianity is all about. Our faith is not in man. Our faith is in God through his son, Jesus. When we think about what we deserve, we do not deserve God's hand. We do not deserve God's blessing. But because God loved us, he looked at us and he says, I love you. So much, I am willing to sacrifice who I am. I'm willing to sacrifice what I have in order for you to gain what you need. And that's a relationship with me. So God sent his only begotten son. We look at that, the brokenness of the redemptive plan. We look at that, and I'll accept Jesus for my salvation. And I accept that I need him for my salvation but when we look at our success, we look at our political landscape, we look at our economic status, we look at what I have done, we have to have the same look at what God has done for us in the political landscape, our financial landscape, in our relationship landscape. What God has done for us is the same thing he's done for us in our salvation. We should have nothing, nothing set apart outside of God's grace and God's forgiveness. If God saved us for our salvation, we must look at what God has done for us in every other area. Okay, politics, religion. They say, never mention them in church. Never look at family reunions and talk about politics and religion. But you know what? The Bible is very clear that God is in charge of everything. And what we must do is we must humbly Go before God and say, Lord, what do you want me to do? And I believe there's three things that we need to do. First, I believe we should vote. I believe we should vote. I believe there's not a Christian that should take the right to vote and put it on coast mode and say, you know what? It doesn't make a difference. It does make a difference. I believe we should vote. And I think we should not only vote, but we should speak up and we should get involved. One of the reasons why I wanted Mr. Pompeo and Mr. T. Hart to be here is I don't believe there's a great opportunity for many of us to reach out and to communicate and talk to men like this very often. I believe we see him on TV. We watched Mr. Pompeo on the uh, Fox News yesterday afternoon talking about this airliner that was shot down. We've talked, we've seen, sometimes we can be in awe of who they are, but to sit down with them and talk to them and shake their hand and look at them face to face, I believe we should not only vote, but I believe we should look at them and we should ask them questions and hear from their heart what they truly believe and what they're all about. Not only vote, we should speak up, but I believe the most important thing is we need to pray. You know, many of you, whether you're Republican or Democrat, many of us vote for our elected officials. And you know what? It's God's mandate to pray for those who have rule over us. It's mandated by the God. Not to just say, oh, I don't like him. But we need to pray for them. So not only vote and speak up, but pray. Pray. Pray that God's heart 
will change people's lives. Pray that what they believe in will change by what God has motivated them in. See, it's easy to get a sound bite. It's easy to, to say a prayer. It's easy to act like a Christian. It's easy to do all kinds of things when you know the camera's watching. But when you're praying for somebody, when you're getting on your knees and asking God's direction, there's not a thing that will ever be changed that God is not in charge of. We can talk about the political landscape. We could talk about Obama. We could talk about the next president or we could talk about the next Congress. The only way this body, the only way the church will ever change one thing about the political landscape in Washington is if this body gets on our knees and we ask God to change their hearts. We ask God to move their direction. We ask God through the power of the Holy Spirit to give them direction and to give them insight and to make sure that there's not a way in this world that they could go against God's word. That's the only way that we're going to change. That's the only way that Kansas is even going to matter. Kansas itself does not matter in Washington. But what matters is God. And we at Kansas, we get together as the, as the Christians, as the churches, we get together and we start praying and the prayers of God will be answered. Kansas will matter because God is in charge. God sets the direction. The power of God could be established so great that whatever Kansas is proclaiming, because God's hand is on it, the Washington elites will come to Kansas to see God's power, to pray with us because God's hand is on us. And if we do not pray, they will never hear. But once we pray, once we ask God's hand, once the church, once the Christians get involved and we say, God, I need you to touch the lives of the president, touch the lives of the Senate, touch the lives of the Congress, touch the lives of the Supreme Court, and God hears our prayer. He's going to turn them from their wicked way. He is going to heal our land. But if we, the church, the Christians, we set we watch, we look at the results, and we wonder why America is going the direction it is. You know what that's called? It's called apathy. That's the biggest sin of all. We have the right. We have the ability. Do we have the courage to vote, to speak up? Do we have the spiritual nature to pray. Even if we do not agree, God is the one that changes people's hearts and changes people's minds. We could speak all day long to go on deaf ears. But all we have to do is we have to speak to the one that loved us to send his son to die for us. He loves you unconditionally. He knows you in and out and he wants to hear you. He's asked us to pray to him. So we fall on our knees, and we talk to God about what he wants for our lives. We tell him our fears, and we say, Lord, give us direction. And he hears our hearts, and we repent from our sin of apathy. He says he's going to do something. He said then he will heal our land. We can't ask a nation to be changed until the Christians have been changed. Until we do something great. Until we do what God has called us to do. As humble ourselves and pray. And ask God to direct our hearts. And direct our nation. That's what we have to do. That's why we need to pray. And that's why we need to vote. Not because what you would say a vote doesn't make a difference. I believe every vote makes a difference. I believe your voice makes a difference. I believe this church's voice makes a difference. But the way it's going to be heard is to God. God's voice is much bigger than your voice. But when you speak to God, when you lay your hands over somebody and pray for them, when you ask God to direct them, you're asking God to move somebody in a mighty way 
to hear the voice in the heart of God so God can direct their life. I believe it's the most important thing that you can do is to vote, is to speak up, and to pray. I'm going to ask Mr. and Mrs. Pompeo to make their way down here to the front, and uh, we're going to be right down here. And uh, we're going to, uh, you can sit right over here at the front row. At the time. Um, we're going to call our church to prayer. We have a little more, a few things that we're going to do at the end of our service. But uh, we're going to ask um, in a few minutes to have everybody to be praying with somebody to touch hands, to lay hands on Mr. and Mrs. Pompeo, just to ask God's blessing upon the church and a blessing upon his future. I believe God's hand, God's blessing, is the most powerful thing that you could ever have. It is worthless to do anything in your own power. It is the most awesome experience in the world is when whatever you're doing, God is blessing. When you wake up and you know, I've got a tough job. I can't make everybody happy. Whatever I do, somebody's going to get mad. But I'm not here to make them happy. I'm here to honor God. And if we honor God, God will take care of everything else. That is the most important thing that we possibly could do. So at the end of our service, we're going to have a time of prayer. But let's go to prayer right now, and I'm going to ask Pastor Al to come up, and at the end of our service, we'll have a time of prayer with Pastor and Mike Pompeo. Dear Father, Lord, be with us today. Lord, guide in our lives. Protect us and honor us. Thank you for allowing us to, to hear the heart of a man that represents the state of Kansas. We thank you for his Christian character and for his heritage. I pray that you'll give him the wisdom, give him the boldness, and give him the courage to continue to vote the way that the word of God tells him he should to stand up for the characters, for the character of the Word of God, for the people of Kansas, to love him, to honor him, and to bless him. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Pastor Al. Well, changing one life at a time makes all the difference in the world, doesn't it? So glad that you're here today. This is the time in which we say hi to all of those that have been visiting with us for the very first time or maybe the second time. And we want you to know how much we appreciate you being with us today and to choose Glenville as your place to worship today. And if you are visiting for the very first time or second time, if you take this card, it's in the chair in front of you. If you'd fill this out, the contact information, we'd appreciate it very much. And on the back side, there's a place for some information. Maybe you made some decisions today. There's also a place on the back side that you can write your prayer request down so that the staff can be praying for you. And we're so glad that, that you're here today. And if you fill out this card, at the end of the service, you take this card to the double doors in front of me, and there will be a reception area. Somebody will be there. And we have a $5 Chick-fil-A card for you that you can go, not today, because they're closed, and you can go get you a good sandwich or something like that. And Congressman, we'd like for you and your wife to go out there too. I know you filled out a card two years ago when you were here, or three years ago, and be sure and fill out another one because I kept your card because it has your autograph on it. <laughs> and I'm thinking maybe 50, 60 years from now, my kids will say, hey, maybe this is worth some money. Okay? <laughs> So if you'd fill out another one, I actually I've got three kids, and so we'd pre I'm, I'm just I'm just joking. So glad, Congressman, your wife being with us today. Please fill one out and get a free chicken sandwich off of us, okay? All right, but if you're here today visiting, please fill out one of these cards. Ushers, why don't you come, if you would, please, and uh, we're going to receive our, our offering today. And I've got a um, little saying I want to put up here on the um, screen, and... Um, it says, money isn't everything, but it ranks right up there with oxygen. You know what I'm talking about? And especially around here during the summertime, I mean, we can hardly breathe because <laughs> it gets pretty tough. And, uh, you know, let's get right down to it. I think that's pretty true. It uh, it's really ranks up there. But I'd like to remind you, you know, the, um, the Dylan gift cards that we have, 
If you can go down, and uh, if those of you that have these cards, be sure and keep it loaded, because Dylan's uh, gives us some money, I think 5% of whatever it is that we load up on that. And so we've been down for the last couple of months a little bit on this, and my wife and I, uh, we put a few hundred dollars a month on there and, and uh, get our gasoline, and um, it helps the church out. And I was thinking, you know, if we really got involved in this, enough people did, load enough money, in a 10-year time, a period of time, we probably could uh, receive close to $100,000 from Dillon's toward this building right here. And just a little bit, all of us doing it together. So uh, pray about it and think about uh, loading up your card once again. And if you don't have one of these cards, you can call the office on Monday through Friday or through Thursday, and they'll help you out. Let's go to the Lord and pray for offering today. Father, we thank you so much that we live in a country in which we live in. And Father, we've been truly blessed. And Father, we want to ask your continued blessings upon us. Thank you for those that serve in so many different areas this nation of ours. Father, I pray that you bless this offering today. Father, that you would multiply it, that you'd use it. God, you can do things with the offering today that we could never do. And we pray, God, that you would just increase it and multiply it. And Father, that we could win people with Christ, to Christ, through the money that's given today. Father, bless this offering in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you for being here today. I'm going to ask uh, Congressman if you would stand down here. And um, as we're being dismissed, if you would make your way to the front, and we'd like to have everybody be involved with this and uh, uh, lay hands on somebody that's laying hands on uh, the Congressman and his wife and praying for their blessing and praying for God's direction. I would like to remind you that as soon as this is over with, the cookie stroll is involved over in the gymnasium, and the women's ministry is in charge of that, and there'll be all kinds of cookies over there for sale. It's a major fundraiser for the women's ministry for the upcoming year. So after we do our prayer, then you can go over and eat, okay? So that's going to be involved. If you would, please make your way up and stand. If you guys would stand right down here and just make your way down here, and we'll wait a couple of seconds to get everybody involved. <laughs> there you go, you get to touch him, there you go. Dear Father, Lord, we just lift up Mike and Susan Pompeo. The impact that they are making, I pray that you'll continue to bless them. I pray, Lord, that you'll give him insight. I pray that the direction that he is leading, the state of Kansas and the nation, will be one that you will open his eyes and open his heart and allow him to perceive exactly what you want him to do. 
I pray that his courage will be one that stands for the right of the word of God to be established. I pray that the church will always be in his mind. I pray that your hand will be upon their relationship, their marriage. I pray that you'll keep them safe. Lord, I ask you just to wrap your arms around them. I pray that you'll love them. More importantly, that you'll just bless them. That the decisions that they make will be the very desires of their heart, will be one that you will direct, that you will honor, that you will bless. Lord, as we evaluate what you want us to do as a church, I thank you for the opportunity that we have had to hear. I pray that you will give us insight in what you would like for us to do. But Lord, our job is to vote. Our job is to follow your leading when we do vote. And our calling is to vote your way, the word of God, what you would have us to do as a church. Give us that wisdom that we need to have. We thank you for that. We thank you for the Pompeos and bless them and give them safety and give them energy over these next few months as they will need to have to finish off this election. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. 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 Mr. Pompeo said that he has a few minutes. If you would like to come by and shake his hands, he'd be glad to stay here and talk to each and every one of you.